Morning. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, taking time to spend a few minutes with the Engine Alliance. Uh, my name is Dean Athens. Um, I'm the president of the Engine Alliance. Uh, this is my uh, second uh, Paris Air Show, so I've uh, been with the program for a few years. With me this morning is our executive vice president uh, from the East, Kevin Vichet, and the head of uh, Airbus A380 Marketing, Franck Vermeer. So to get started with our program, I want to um, uh, you know share one of our ads um, as we kick off this program update. Um, you know, I often get asked the question, you know, you know, is the Engine Alliance functional? Is it how is it working? You know, between two competitors, and um, you know, it's absolutely just not an issue because everyone who works for the Engine Alliance just thinks about the Engine Alliance. We work as function as one team, and we act like we we work for each other. Um, uh, you know, in the ads, you know, the thing I like about the, the something bigger than an A380, and the A380 is a very big thing, but what this is, is, is really indicating is that, uh, you know, we've got a great Engine Alliance team, and we've got super resources that, that are dedicated to our program, um, but then we have the full power of all the resources uh, of two big uh, parent companies. And we're able to leverage the full weight of those, those resources uh, back at each of our companies. Uh, so we've got a we've got a great program. Um, it's a it's a, a great engine. You know we're going to go through. We're going to share some of the progress and changes and things we've been working on. Um, and and you know it starts with uh, leveraging great technology. We all know and we, we've talked about it before that that the GP. Is uh, leverages the GE90 technology in the core and the PW4000 family uh, technology for the, the the fan LPC and LPT, and and it's provided a great foundation for our program. Um, and and but you know but why does that why do those technologies work so well? And, and you know the the real reason for that is when we created the GP engine, I mean it it was sized just right and it was very well executed. Uh, you know, for example, even though it's, it's based on the GE90 uh, core, um, it's the third iteration of that design. Um, it's, the, it's the smallest, you know, compared to the other GE90 models, but it is the most thermodynamically efficient of all of them. And what that results in is some great benefits <coughs> for our customers. We've got, in, in, you know, better fuel burn, uh, allows you to go further with more payload, uh, and, and we're going to talk about this morning about the excellent performance and the, and the reliability and the durability of the engine is really starting to come through. Um, you know, it's great to initialize on wing with 105 degrees C of a VGT margin. You know, so our customers don't have to worry. Um, you know, for a long time uh, of ever seeing a you know an EGT warning on the flight deck um, as they're in takeoff or climb. And uh, you know, with our, our great 116-inch fan, you know, with the quietest engine for the A380, also. So the uh, you know the the program is growing, the fleet is growing, and you can see this chart showing our our uh, our stretch across the globe on the A380. Uh, we've got 90 aircraft in service. Uh, we've got 40 aircraft uh, more. To deliver 48 aircraft to deliver with uh, GP power, and uh, you know we really ramped up the program in, in 2014 at a, at a pretty high rate of, of production. We're maintaining that throughout this year, and actually our, our kind of our busiest production ever is still still ahead of us as we head into the beginning of 2016. Um, and you know again being bigger, you know something bigger than the A380 is is our ability as as the A380 grows across the globe and, and goes to new destinations, we're able to lean into the field service network and support network uh, of both our parent companies. So it gives us, it literally gives us almost twice as many resources to, to support the product and, 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 and we do leverage that. So I, I mentioned before that, uh, you know, we're really pleased with the, with the reliability, um, you know, the and this is stuff that our customers can actually feel. Um, you know, there it, it's it's uh, definitely more comfortable, and uh, and they can rest at ease that the product's going to perform. 
you know, in, two, in 2013, we were working some, some fleet programs and some, um, some challenges kind of in the, the maturing phase of the, of the program. And, uh, you know, we've really got our arms around these, these programs. We've got retrofits and improvements and in place, and it's really all come, come under control and, and, and been a much easier program to, to, to work with going forward. And it, the numbers are spectacular. So we, we did a comparison over the last uh, couple of years leading up to March 2015. I'm, so I'm happy to say that this number today is 99.93. This number is 0 0.015, and this one's 0 0.055. So even since March, uh, the, the numbers are continuing to improve. And although we've, you know, we've done a lot of work and, and things have, have, have gotten better, the best is still ahead of us. Because although we've, we've put these programs in place, we're still implementing them, we're still growing them. And, and we realize that this industry has cycles, and, and we're not gonna wait for the next cycle to find us. We're doing a lot of proactive things. I'm gonna share a little bit later to make sure this uh, this reliability and durability story continues to grow. One of our consistent priorities is taking care of our customers and supporting our customers. Um, and our M MRO network is is growing to, to support that and, and to uh, achieve that as the fleet continues to grow and mature. Um, you know, 2015 is, is kind of a big year in this respect. Um, so we've got uh, full, you know, certified facilities now uh, at uh, Paris Orly, the Air France shop, and the new engine maintenance center in Dubai. Um, both those shops have inducted their first GP7000 engines for overhaul. So now we've got three <coughs> facilities across the globe that have the capability to overhaul a GP7000 engine. We've also invested in some additional rotable modules, additional facilities, so that we've got more capabilities for local repairs as well. And then the fleet is growing, of course. Um, last fall and early last winter, um, both Qatar and Etihad went into service. Um, and you can see Qatar, uh, fifth A380 parked right outside here. Uh, Etihad is now operating three A380s. And, uh, you know, by the time Memorance is done, they're going to have close to 400 GP7000 engines, uh, of which we've delivered about two-thirds of those today. And so supporting these and maintaining these and growing that reliability um, is our prime focus. So each of the last uh, big air shows, I've provided updates on an HPT uh, durability upgrade. In 2013, I talked about the design effort that was being kicked off to do that, um, and that design effort uh, was successful. We froze the design in the fall of 2013 on schedule. In 2014, I was at Farm Bureau talking about how we were getting ready and, and putting this uh, all this new design configuration and hardware into production. Um, that successfully happened on schedule by the end of June in 2014, and now we're We've successfully launched this into, into production and we are now delivering it to our customers. So, um, and, and today, uh, June 2015, we've already um, built and tested over 50 engines with this new HPT upgrade design and it's, it's absolutely exceeding our expectations. Um, you know, we thought we might see a little uh, uh, point or two in uh, performance for the moving the cooling air we did in this uh, uh, new design and we haven't seen after 50 engines we actually saw a slight improvement in performance at the same time we committed to Airbus that we would absolutely keep the performance neutral on this HPT upgrade um, so we had several performance improvements that we're doing concurrently with durability configuration so when we complete those performance upgrade we actually expect that when this is all finished and we collect enough data, we'll actually see improved performance with the new higher durability configuration. So uh, uh, this is a, a great program, and we've kept everything on schedule, exceeding expectations. I'm very excited when we get this across everyone's fleet and start seeing the results. So the, you know, the, the big thing we were doing when we designed that net new HPT was to provide uh, greater time on wing and see less distress in the hardware as it aged. 
but it also provided some other great benefits in improved EGT and performance retention. So on an EGT basis, we're going to see 10 degrees better EGT margin retention and a half a point in SFC retention. And we didn't rest. We're not going to just design this stuff, put it out, and, and see how it works with our customers. We're making a big investment this year. Um, the picture you see on the right is a development test engine in a specialized cell. And there's a uh, specially designed rig in front of that. That rig um, um, allows the engine to ingest specially engineered dust that simulates the environment in the Middle East. And, and before this test is run, we're going to have, we're going to have ingested 80 pounds of the specially engineered dust. We're going to run 2,500 cycles that simulates the damage that would be accumulated in the field of 3,500 cycles. So uh, today this, this uh, test is running. We've accumulated over 1,200 cycles. Uh, the dust rig and the engine are working fine and we've, we've, put a, we've put a borescope in the engine and we've confirmed the dust is definitely in there. Um, so we're really proud of this. We're, you know, we're, we're going to validate uh, what we do um, before our customers get to the end of the life uh, of this hardware when it's in the field. And as I mentioned before, we, you know, we committed to do some fuel burn improvements concurrent with this new design. Um, our new software that improves the, uh, the case cooling during climb um, is on track for introduction by the end of the year. And you know we love software improvements because it's very quick to implement. I mean, it'll it'll take less than two months. Uh, the upgrade will be implemented across the fleet. So this software reduces metal temperatures during climb up to 40 degrees C, and at the same time in, improves fuel burn during climb by up to one percent. Um, so uh, it's a it's a significant um, benefit, and we're looking forward to get that uh, in the fleet. We've also uh, um, optimized our shroud grind because we're going to see less deterioration in that HPT. We can optimize the grind and keep, uh, take advantage of that. And that's what's going to bring some additional fuel burn performance as well as that um, performance retention. And then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about you know, the things we're doing about the future of the program. So at some of the other air shows, we talked about having product strategy um, efforts and, and program plans, and, and we've continued to develop that. And so what we've done is we've engaged additional preliminary design resources, and we've taken the technology that we, that we developed and leveraged in 2014 for our product strategy and actually did some design work. So we went through each module, and we took those technologies and we had our design, preliminary design engineers uh, design the parts and the hardware so that we could create a new performance model that we could, that we could simulate flight on an A380 and estimate the actual performance benefit. So some of those technologies include uh, the latest uh, 3D aero, some advanced materials, um, the next generation of case cooling designs, um, improvements in the flow path, and, and some more airfo airfoil surface finish technology. Um, and and it, the, the benefits uh, scam the, gal the, the gamut of weight, durability, and performance. Now we, you know, we still have to take this in the context of the A380 program, um, determine what different possibility and packages make the most sense, and uh, you know, it's, it's incumbent on us to see if we can find a good uh, business case that allows us to launch something and move forward. And what we're, what we're doing today is we're really kind of focusing on two different options. So one way to take this, this technology is to find out how much we can do um, efficiently that would enable a, a retrofitable package so that every engine that we've delivered could, could leverage the new technology and at a shop visit you could very easily, instead of repairing or replacing the same parts, put in an upgraded um, uh, designs and get more performance. And then this, the second version takes that a step further and, and leverages the later technologies of uh, 3D aero and computational fluid dynamics and actually change the airfoil counts throughout the flow path. Now that would change the, uh, 
um, the, the airfoils and the, and the rotating hardware. So that, that, that and when we do that engine, so it'd be very replaceable on wing, so not require a lot of uh, modifications at the aircraft level. Um, but because the airfoil counts change, it, it would not be lend itself easily to upgrades at a shop visit. So, um, there'll be uh, there'll be more on that as the as as the uh, A380 continues to develop. And uh, um, anyway, uh, very exciting about uh, the future of this program. Um, this is my last slide. Um, you know, please let me know if, uh, if you have any questions. Yeah, uh, I had a couple. One. Um, on the HPT rollout, where, where is that actually now in terms of coming out? And what's the timeline on this decision on the uh, kind of the future development of the engine? Um, so the, I mean, the timing, you know, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're kind of waiting to see what direction Airbus prefers to go. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at business cases. So, in, in some sense, we're only limited by how quickly we can come up with our own business case. Um, the first question on the HPT, um, so we, you know, the first engine with that configuration was built um, in our factories at the end of June. Um, so uh, the, this, the third aircraft from, for Etihad has that configuration. The fifth aircraft for Cotter has that configuration. The latest aircraft from Emirates has that configuration already built in. Um, in first quarter of this year, we delivered our first engine from our MRO facility at Wales with that new configuration um, upgraded uh, at, at that overhaul. So it's, it's, I mean, it's out. It's in the field. It's now flying. And like I mentioned, uh, that we've, we've had more than 50 engines already go through final tests so that we saw the, the actual results. Okay. Uh, back to the other question, just to, I mean, is, is effectively this study your 380 Neo proposition to put it bluntly? Yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> Kind of, you know, taking <coughs> take, taking this to the limit um, is that, and you know, we did do some some studies on looking at what we did could do if we if we you know changed the core, went to a uh, next generation 10 stage compressor instead of a nine stage compressor. And, and um, it, the, the benefit just wasn't there. And, and, and that's because this nine stage compressor is so efficient that, that we, by upgrading this, we can do just as good as, as new technology 10 stage. So if we take this package, what would be the maximum gain you could do? Is it 2% or 2 and a half? Um, th that's probably in the right neighborhood. I'm not gonna get too <laughs> precise okay. there. Uh, you know, and it's a, uh, you know, it's not a linear scale with investment. So as you get further and further right. down, because you can always do more, right. but that that you know that extra quarter percent, that extra half percent, mm -hmm. gets more and more expensive, and to a certain point, it becomes prohibitive from a business case perspective. Okay. So, sorry, when you say you know, changing airfoil count, are you talking about desolidifying in the compressor? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Lower solidity. Lower solidity. <laughs> So, you know, for example, in the fan, um, you know, the, the second case of doing the maximum uh, new 3D aero technology, we would go from 24 to 22 um, fan blades. Okay. And, and that, you know, that concept would flow through, throughout the entire flow path. Would that also give you a higher uh, mass flow through the engine, meaning you can knock the power if you need it? We would increase the, uh, yes. I mean, and, and, you know, I mentioned before how we, we really did a good job of executing the program 10 years ago and, and sizing it right. Mm -hmm. This engine has size to grow thrust. Um, and, but when we, when you, you know, what either the options will either the upgrade option or the lower solidity option, both cases allow us to do some optimization as far as core speed and stage loading. Mm -hmm. So yes, yep, and 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 increase the overall pressure ratio, particularly across the compressor. How much? 10%, 5%? Uh, th again, you're in the right ballpark. <laughs> this specially engineered dust, um, how, does, how have you engineered it? <laughs> sort of roughly speaking, I mean, is it a sort of synthetic type of product or have you just, um, is it simpler than that? 
No, I, uh, and, and uh, to be honest, I don't have all the details, but what we're looking for is, is something that sticks to the airfoil surfaces and, and something that will accumulate in the cooling passages, similar to the dust in, in the uh, Middle East. So those are the aspects that our engineers have, have used to make sure that we are able to simulate the same amount of damage that we would see in service, only on an accelerated basis. So you do have the uh, uh, variable gate uh, uh, doors going inward, going in the flow path on yes. this one as well. So it's a D90 principle. Um, well, no. So oh, the, oh, the, the variable uh, vein uh, bleed system yeah. for the, the, uh, the fan yeah. is actually a, a, uh, a Pratt & Whitney uh, design. Okay, so that explains the problem. <laughs> it, it, it's a potential contributor. <laughs> Given the HPT stuff hasn't really, or is just now hitting the fleet, how, what has then driven the reliability upgrade over the two years, improvement over the two years you've seen? So if it wasn't the thing that I was supposed to drive. Well, that's why, and that's why I said the, the best is really ahead of us. Right. So, um, and, and I'm glad you asked that question. So, you know, we, we put uh, control programs in place to make sure that we can, can monitor the fleet and, and catch things before they become an operational issue. Um, so we've got a very robust diagnostics program. And today, our di engine diagnostics, um, we have 26 separate algorithms that monitor a combination of, of engine parameters so that we can detect and, uh, and alert um, potential issues before they ever get close to becoming an operational problem. So those 26 algorithms are certainly contributing and, and we've got some specific algorithms uh, around the distress that we see in the HPT or have seen. Now, at the same time we do that, um, you know, we run the risk of adding maintenance burden to our airlines, more service bulletins, more inspections. And so what we did in the beginning of 2014 is we said, well, not only are we going to improve your reliability, we're going to reduce your maintenance burden. So we took a, we took a challenge and we achieved a 25% reduction in the maintenance burden required to maintain the engine. And the configuration that we're delivering today in Potter 5, Etihad 3, and every new engine coming out of our factory, there is zero additional maintenance burden above the standard maintenance planning guide. And can I also ask a production question? Because you alluded to, um, you actually the, the peak production yes. year is still ahead. So, so I guess the question is, what is going to be the year of peak production for you guys? And under the current order book, when does production actually cease? Um, so I'll answer the first question. <laughs> um, our, you know, we're, our, our peak is going gonna, is gonna to be January of 2016. That is going to be our busiest month of deliveries to, to Airbus. Um, as far as the... How many the, engines will that be? We're going to deliver 18 engines or more, depending upon the spares, in the month of January. 2016. What's been the peak so far? It's been 12, 12. but in January we hit, we hit 18 for a month plus fares. So as far as the you know the skyline, I don't know, Frank, if you've got a better idea of, of where the orders are going sure. forward. So for the next three years we are uh, fully booked in terms of deliveries, and then beyond that uh, we have um, obviously deliveries, but we can't comment specifically on when the customer deliveries will be. We certainly have a, a style out right full for the next three days. Right, but, but technically, I mean, really, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an Emirates question. Under the current engine alliance powered Emirates order book, the last one ships in 2018, as, as it's now. Is that basically right? I mean, I, I can't comment on the, the specific deliveries of customers. Oh. I'm glad I let him answer that. <laughs> I'm sorry if I missed it at the start, but how many engines have you actually delivered now so far? So, um, 90 aircraft, so that's going to be uh, 360 engines plus spares, we're, so we're, we're looking at about 400 engines today. I, I said that I said that was in the right neighborhood ballpark. <laughs> was that? Um, so that that would be SFC then. Yes. Okay. And 
<laughs> What's what were the timeline for the uh, any A380 Neo engine? How, how soon could you have it ready? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, assuming uh, assuming Airbus says yeah, do it, you know. Right. I mean that, that's a very open question, and at the yeah. moment we are studying a lot of different options. Um, uh, no decision is made, um, and we would only make that decision on the basis of business case, and, and the timeline is very much integral to, to that business case. So let me follow up to say that you know the technologies that we've used, that we've analyzed in our preliminary design effort, are technologies that we've leveraged. You know, there's been a lot of development in, in both our parent companies. A lot of investment, a lot of new technologies. We're leveraging those new, new technologies from those latest programs, and so we're, we're we're leveraging technology. We say is at technology readiness level six, which means it's it's got a prototype that's at least been tested in an engine. So we're we're picking some technology that um, we're not going to have to do new inventions. And so you know once we you know we're able to work out and we understand product strategy, particularly at the aircraft level. Uh, we estimate 30 to 36 months we'd be able to certify engine upgrades, and that could be less or more depending upon where our business case ends up. Would you say then, would you characterize your offering as more conservative than Brundex? From what you, from what you gather of what, what they might, might be thinking about? Yes. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love questions that I can answer with a yes or a no. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for um, spending time with us this morning. Um, if you do think of questions later on in the show, uh, you know, please stop by our booth in, in Hall 5. Um, you can also reach out to Nathan Hicks, uh, the Engine Alliance uh, Marketing Director.